Well, good morning. Uh, We're gl- grateful that you have joined us on this beautiful day. It is absolutely amazing. Actually, it's a little hot here in LA, but we are glad that you are here. And only in LA will you have like 90 degrees in the middle of November, right? And so, and the crazy part is, is that next Sunday is Thanksgiving Sunday. Um, as we come, as we give thanks for the many blessings that God has provided um, within our lives, indeed. And hopefully that all of you can join us uh, for our Thanksgiving Sunday worship um, as we come, as we eat together, as we fellowship together. But most importantly, as we come together and we reflect upon all the blessings that God has given us within our lives. And so whether it be our second site, whether it be our L.A. site, there will be a special luncheon afterwards, as we do every year, as we have a potluck to come together and to eat and to just come together as a community. And we know for many of you, we have not seen you for a while, so if you have the opportunity, we would love for you to come and join us as we come together once again as a body of Christ. But this morning, can we all arise as we, become, as we come before God's presence and as we hear God's call to worship today that comes from Psalm 104, verses 31 through 35. And this is the reading of God's holy and precious word. And may you pay close attention to it. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles. Who touches the mountain and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him. For I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. This this morning, can we come and may we give glory to the Lord for all who he is and for all that he has done indeed. Let us pray. Father, you are the creator of all things. You are the creator of the earth. And Father God, today, Lord, we are able to bask in this wonderful day, Lord, as we experience the warmth of this weather. And Father God, what a beautiful day it is, especially here in the middle of November. And Father God, as we reflect, Lord, we remember that God, it is you who has brought all things into existence. And Father God, we give you the glory. Father God, we are once again reminded that you are truly worthy indeed. And Father, this past week, Lord, we know that we celebrated our veterans. Father God, for those who have sacrificed our lives, Lord, so that we may have our freedoms, so that we may be able to do this, to come together and to worship. And I pray that, God, that we will not take these things for granted, but that, God, that we would always remember what a privilege it is, is to come before your presence. That, God, that, Lord, that we know that you are here that, God, that you are with us as we come and as we worship your name. And especially today as we come to your table. I pray that, God, that we would see the significance, the beauty, and the majesty of what your table is all about. Now, God, that we will be humbled by your love for us indeed. So, Father God, we look forward to coming and worshiping your name. And we pray that, God, that you would be honored and glorified here in this place. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Done great things. We dance in your freedom. Away. 
your promises, yes and amen, you will do great things, God you do great things. Hallelujah.
here I am. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to this time. <clears throat> and as we continue our worship, not only do we sing the songs of our hearts as we bring praise to God for who He is and all that He has done, but we take the time to really confess to the things that we believe in as a body of Christ. For there are many who come and visit, and so often they ask the question, what is it that the church believes? And this is our opportunity to declare to the world to the things that we do believe in. And Today, we're going to be looking at the Westminster Shorter Catechism, a doctrine, a, 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 a catechism that we hold on to, the things that we believe. We believe it's a good summary of our Christian faith. And every Sunday, we read the question, and we answer by, uh, by uh, giving the answer. And I pray that today that, again, that these things, these truths will truly speak upon your hearts indeed. And so question 37 asks, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at death? Amen. Today, the question asks, what benefits do we have when we die, especially for those, who us, for, for those of us who are in Christ? We believe that when we die, that death is not the end, but there is a glorious hope for all of us that our, when we die, that our souls go to heaven to be with the Lord, and our bodies are still on the grave. But we look forward to the great resurrection when Christ comes again, where our bodies will be united with our souls so that we can live with him for all eternity. Uh, and to joy His goodness and grace forever, that we will worship His name wherever we may be and give glory to Him. You see, that is why when someone passes away, for those of, those, for those of them who are in Christ, we do not grieve as one without hope. Could we know where their future lies? It lies with Him indeed. And that's why we implore everyone who does not know Christ to come to know Him so that you would have that hope of the resurrection as well. And so in response to this glorious confession, I'd like to ask you to join with me as we sing this hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Demands 
And this morning, as we come before the Lord in a time of confession of sin, as we just sang that hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross, as we reflect upon the gruesome death of Christ upon that cross, it gives us the reality to understand the gruesomeness of our very own sin. That as you get amazed by the heinous nature of the cross, you ask yourself that question, why did he have to die such a heinous death? If you can understand, perhaps, how heinous our sins are in deed. That our sins are truly an offense before God. And so often we think about that, you know what, it's only the things that we go against him. But also at the same time, we also fail to do the things that he asks us to do as well. Whether it's a sin of omission or the sin of commission, they are both equally heinous in the guise of God indeed. And that's why the Lord invites us to a time of confession of sin. That we remind ourselves of the reality of that nature. The reality of that sin. That every week as we come before the Lord, how we have fallen short to live the life that God has called us to live. And how we are in offense before Him. But I realize that we will not be amazed by the glory of God's grace until we begin to understand the depth of the reality of our sin. For when you see the depth of the reality of your sin and you hear the assurance of the pardon of your sin, then you realize how amazing God's love is, truly. That in spite of the evil and the heinousness of our, the, the disgusting nature of our sins, that He still loves us. And that is what we embrace. That is why we stand amazed by the reality of God's love indeed. So my dear friends, come as you are. We live in a world where we have to have a certain image. We try to put up a front. But God sees the reality of who you are. And he simply wants us to come and acknowledge ourselves so that you know how much you are loved in spite of your sins. So can we come boldly to the throne of grace and to lay down our burdens before him? Let us pray. Word of God declares from Psalm 103, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he rem remove our transgressions from us. My dear friends, today, if you confess your sins because you have put your hope in Christ, then as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I declare to you today that your sins are forgiven you as far as the east is from the west because the Lord is merciful and gracious indeed. And may the beauty and the wonder of this gospel bring you great joy and peace both now and forevermore. Amen. In response to the assurance of pardon of sin, can we all, all arise as we bring our offering and tithes before the Lord and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, Please join me as we pray on behalf of these wonderful blessings. Father God, we are grateful 
for your manifold blessings upon our lives. Father God, especially in the midst of this pandemic, Father God, where our lives have been turned upside down, where there has been much difficulty, much hardship. And yet, Father God, through it all, Lord, you have continued to be faithful, that God, that you have continued to provide it, and that you continue to watch over us. And Father God, as a reminder of that, Lord, that, Lord, there's so many things that we cannot control, that, thou, that Father God, things in this world happen that is beyond us. And yet, Father God, even though these things we cannot control, Father God, we find great comfort knowing that, Lord, that you are the one who is with us, the one who goes with us indeed. But yet at the same time, Father, we know that there are those who have suffered. There are those who have lost loved ones. There are those, Father God, who are struggling. That, God, as we see inflation and the prices rising, there are those, Lord, who perhaps cannot even afford to have a meal at the table, who cannot provide even the basic necessities of life. And, Father God, we pray that you will minister to them. And we pray that, God, that you will provide. And that, God, that you would use us as a church, Lord, to be a blessing to those, Father God, who have so little. That, God, in the midst of our bounty, that, God, that we will learn not to hoard it for ourselves, but that, God, that we will be gracious enough to share it with those who are in need. And especially in this season, Father God, as we celebrate Thanksgiving, as we, Father God, come into the Christmas season, as we celebrate the birth of your Son, that, God, how can we not share, Lord, when you have given us everything in your Son? When, Father God, you've given us more than we deserve. Father God, you've given us more than we need. And I pray that, God, that we'll learn to use that, God, the blessings that you've given us so that we can be a blessing. And I pray that our church will be that blessing, that, God, that we'll be cognizant of those, Lord, who are in need. And I pray for our church, the members of our church, that, God, that we will spend a moment, Lord, to be that blessing. That today, if we, as we come with our boxes, Lord, to help children, Lord, to celebrate a little bit, Lord, with Operation Christmas Child. We pray that, God, that these boxes will truly be a blessing. That, God, that the people that receive these boxes will see that act of love. That they will see that, God, that they are not alone. That, God, that people do care. But most importantly, that, God, that you care and that you love them. And I pray that, God, that we can be that vehicle, even with these boxes, Lord, to be a blessing. Father, we also pray that, Lord, that you will be with our missionaries. Father God, we're so grateful for Pastor Damon and Young Me and Leah and Michaela, Lord, in Japan, and for Tim and Musik and Irene, Lord, in Cambodia. Father God, just the other day, Lord, just hear about Cambodia, to see the church able to come back in person again in Cambodia. Lord, what a wonderful blessing. And Father God, we are grateful. And Father, I pray that, Lord, that you continue to watch over that church in Cambodia. That, Lord, that you give them the opportunity to continue to meet together. That, God, the numbers of COVID will get better. And that, Lord, the church can be a beacon and a light to love the people that are there. So, Father God, we are grateful for Tim and Musak and Irene and the work that they're doing in Cambodia. And we pray that, God, that you continue to provide for them and minister through them. And that, God, that you would watch over them and encourage them, Lord, that they will truly find the strength to do the ministry which you have called them to do. And we pray that, God, they be with our beloved child family, Lord, in, in Japan. Father God, we pray that you continue to restore them and strengthen their family. We pray that, God, that you will continue to provide. And may the gospel, Lord, truly penetrate their hearts and we pray that, God, that they will truly be healed and restored. So that, God, that they can truly be that blessing and that witness and that light there in Japan. And we pray that, God, they may minister through them and to them. And that, God, that your glory may be seen indeed. And, Father, I pray for us here in this room today. Father, God, we are grateful for those who have come to, get, to, come to join us today for the very first time. And we pray that, Lord, that they will see the beauty and the glory and the height of your love indeed. And I pray that, God, that today that which so often is ordinary will truly be extraordinary. That, God, that as we come and as we reflect upon your table, your Lord's Supper, our communion, that, God, that we would truly be humbled by the height and the depth of your love for us indeed. So, God, we give you all the glory and in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Today, I have to ask you to join with me as we're going through the book of Mark as a church. And today, we're going to be looking at Mark um, 14 today. Mark 14. And I was, I was so blessed to realize that this text today for our LA site coincides with our communion today that we will be participating in today. And for those of you who are not believers, communion is where we celebrate the Lord's Supper where we come together as a body of Christ and we eat the bread and we drink the cup in remembrance of what Christ has done for us. And as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, reminding ourselves that we are coming 
before him, that he is present with us at the Lord's table indeed. And I pray that as you witness this, that you would be encouraged and that you would see perhaps the beauty of God's love for his people and his church. And today I'd like to ask you to uh, join me in Mark 14 as we look at verses 12 through 25. <clears throat> On the, first day of Pente- on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man jar- carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where, may- where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready, there prepared for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and they were reclining at table and eating. Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one of you who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the twelve, one of who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them. And said, take this, my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given things, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not eat again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Amen. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. I think that perhaps the greatest tragedy um, in the church, perhaps, maybe I'm overstating this, uh, during COVID, and especially during the lockdowns of the church, um, something that I had wrestled with, something that to this day bothered me a great deal, that as a minister of the gospel, that I was ashamed that we were not able to do this. And that's coming to the table, that we're not able to offer the communion. And it hurt me because I, for, I think that for many of us, we take it for granted. We just go through the motion of coming to the Lord's table, but yet we forget the significance and the importance of what the Lord's table is all about. That really God has given us a sacrament for a reason. For a reason. That through the visible signs, through our sensible signs, that we would experience the gospel, that we remember that Christ is the one who is present with us. As we come to the table, as we remember the body that was broken, the blood that was shed, as we remember that Christ's presence is with us and as it causes us to look forward to the day that we will eat up this feast and the glories of heaven, there is no, perhaps no greater sacrament that gives us that hope than the Lord's table. And yet we are not able to come and to eat, to distribute, to participate in the Lord's table. And I pray that today, that as we come and we understand what we have read today, that you will not take this table for granted. That when we tell you to prepare your hearts to the Lord's table, that you you remember this moment. That you remember the very first time that the Last Supper was given. Of why it was so important and what it meant. And why the sacrament continues today for the sake of the church. For in the church, there are only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism we only do once in our lives, but the Lord's Supper we're supposed to do always. And perhaps even in our church, we don't do this frequently enough. But maybe we should, as reflect upon what the table is all about indeed. You see, in the Lord's Supper, that we are reminded of God's presence, that He is with us, and that we are reminded of God's promise that we will be with Him in glory. And today I hope, my hope is that you will see the beauty, the grace, the love, and what the Lord's Supper is really all about. Because this was the very last meal that Christ was shared with his disciples. The very last meal that he would have the sweet communion with the very ones that he loved indeed. 
And it's a meal I believe that they will never, ever forget, not because it was simply the final and last meal, but because of what Christ shared with them during that meal, as they would eat the bread and they would drink the cup indeed. Even though they may not have fully understood that moment, at that moment, while they were eating. It was not until perhaps after the death and resurrection that they understood the full significance of what that meal was all about. It is that meal, perhaps. And is there that act of devotion that we're reminded of God's great devotion to us, where God gave up his most prized possession himself, who is his son, Jesus Christ, and God shattered his son upon that cross so that you and I will be poured out with his love and his devotion to us. And yet, even though we saw this great extravagance of the, what this woman has done, we also saw in that moment the great betrayal as Judas Iscariot would look for the opportunity to come and betray Jesus. And was looking for that moment as this woman was looking for the opportunity to show love. Judas was looking for the opportunity to betray Jesus. In the same way, we see that in the Lord's Supper as well. We see a great love being displayed. At the same time, a great witness, a great wickedness that's about to be unfolded. You see, when does this last meal take place? We are told that this last meal takes place during the Passover. The Passover. And we all perhaps know what the Passover is. This is perhaps the most important feast in the life of Israel, right? We know that in Israel, they have seven feasts in their history. But nothing is more important than the feast of the Passover, Remember what that feast commemorated, right? Perhaps the most important light, most important moment in the life of Israel. In that moment where God freed them, the nation of Israel, from the tyranny of Egypt. Remember that God heard their outcry and that God would send the final plague out of the tent. Remember what the last plague was, that the firstborn in every house will be killed, right? If, if Egypt would not let God's people go. That God will bring us justice by killing the firstborn male in that household. Unless they slaughter a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost. So that when the angel of death flies by, that those who did not have the blood on the lamppost, on the doorpost, the firstborn would die. But if they did, that firstborn would be spared. So that day, there was a death in every household. Either a death of a lamb or a death of a child. But this was God's judgment for the nation of Egypt. And that's why they celebrated this moment. They were reminded how God enabled their freedom. How God finally, that Pharaoh finally let God's people go because of this final plague. And yet to celebrate this event, families would get together. And they would provide this meal and they would eat this meal in a certain way. And this is the meal that Christ would prepare for his disciples. But today, when we look at this way that he prepared this meal, is radically different than the Passover meal that they were used to. There are going to be some surprises, and I'm going to highlight those surprises, because you see, it shows us the significance of what Christ was trying to tell his disciples by these changes in this meal. And a meal that they've eaten for their whole life. A meal that they will be completely revolutionized. And which will come as an utter shock to the disciples as well. It will be a meal that will be forever changed. Now understand how this meal went according to tradition to the Jewish people. He said, first of all, the table would be prepared with four cups of wine. Now that, that's my kind of party, right? Four cups of wine, right? And the wine will be drank at, at different moments. Remember that. There were four cups of wine. And the four cups of wine reminded the people of the very four promises of God during the Exodus, right? Rescue from Egypt, number one. Redemption by God's divine power, number two. And a renewed renew relationship with God, right? This is the things that God had promised them, right? And so, therefore, the celebration will begin with the host, who is the head of the household, what he would he do? He would drink the first glass of wine. And when he would drink the first glass of wine, he would have a prayer, and they would sing songs, and the meal would come in, the meal. Now, it would consist of a couple of things. The first thing it would consist of is a brick-shaped concoction of fruits and nuts. 
and vinegar. And it was red in color. It was red in color. Why? Because you see this concoction of vegetables and vinegar and nuts would remind them of the bricks that they had to make during their time of Egypt. Right? They were building all these monuments, all these things for the nation of Egypt. And how hard it was. It reminded them of that misery. Also, this meal would include bitter herbs that would come with this meal. Why? Because we remind them of their bitterness, of their slavery in Egypt, right? So you have this concoction of nuts and vinegar and a vegetable, and then you had this bitter herbs that they would have to eat. And then you would also have unleavened bread, bread without yeast. Why? Because we reminded them how they would have to leave quickly during the Passover, how there was no time that when that plague finally hit, that they were finally freed, that they would have to go immediately. And that unleavened bread reminded them of their hasty departure. And last but not least, there was a lamb. A lamb that was slaughtered in the temple and therefore brought home and prepared to eat as part of the feast. And that lamb reminded them of what? The blood of the lamb that was put on the doorpost so that the firstborn of that household would be saved. And then after eating this meal, the eldest son would ask, why do we eat these foods on this night? And then the host would retell the Exodus story and the Passover story, and they would sing praise. And then the second cup of wine was consumed. And then the host would take the bread and bless it and break it. And he would share it with everyone who would dip their bread into the bitter herbs. And he would say, this is the body of the Passover feast. And then they would drink their third cup and would pray and sing another song. And then they would drink the fourth cup of wine, which was the end of the Passover meal. That is how it was supposed to happen, right? Yet Christ will prepare this Passover meal differently. You see, before he begins this Passover meal... Remember, this was before the family. He makes an astonishing statement before the disciples. He says, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Here they're about to celebrate the Passover, and yet Jesus says to them, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. This is the very last meal that he will have with his disciples. And he makes this astonishing claim that someone is going to betray him. You see, in this intimate setting, he's telling this horrible truth that someone who is betraying him, who is eating with him. You can only imagine the disciples who are thinking, who would have the audacity to eat this meal with us, knowing that that person is going to eventually betray Jesus? It had to be absolutely shocking. That's just like Psalm 41, 9 says. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But notice something. When Jesus makes a statement, they don't look around. They don't start accusing. I wonder who it is. Is it Peter? Is it John? Is it Andrew? Is it Matthew? Is it Judas? Who is it? They don't start accusing others. But what's interesting is this. They began to be sorrowful and said to him one after another, Is it I? Is it I, Lord? They dare not look at others, but they examined themselves before they ate this meal. Even Judas. When he said, someone will betray me, they said, Is it I? Why would they think like that? It's because maybe they understood that they too were capable of this heinous sin. They say, is it I, Lord, because they know their own hearts. They say, is it I, Lord, because maybe after there were moments where they have thought to themselves, I need to depart, I need to leave, I don't want to follow Jesus, maybe, I don't know, but they say, is it I? They don't say, is it them? Is it him? Is it I? Is it I, Lord? They realized that they too were capable. And that moment, Christ could have said, no, it's Judas. But he doesn't do that. 
He simply says, it is one of the twelve, one who's dipping bread into the dish with me. Now, obviously, there had to be more than the twelve disciples there. Now, he narrows it to one of the twelve. He doesn't call out Judas. It is almost the fact that it doesn't make it sound like they can figure out who it is. But what he does says to them is that one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. They're all going to dip the bread into the dish with him. For the Son of Man goes out, it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have, never, if it would have been better for that man if he had never been born. Not only does he say that someone's going to betray me, but he tells him the curse for that betrayal. It would have been better for that man as if he were never ever to be born. That's frightening. To say that you would better if you never existed in this world for what that person will do. Yet perhaps Christ tells us, whoa, tell us this curse of this judgment. Perhaps it may be to tell that betrayer, there is still time for you to repent. Still time for you to turn away. Still time for you to be right. And it blows my mind that Christ would share this meal, this intimate meal, even with his betrayer. He would even cry out this curse to say, you know what, there's still time for you. And this is when you see the full extent of God's love, the full extent of God's invitation. As each one asks, is it I, Lord? But the reality is that they will all betray him. Even though we know that there was one betrayer who would eventually hand him over to the chief priest, hand him over to be crucified on a cross. But all 11 would deny him. All 11 would want nothing to do with him after he was arrested. They will all abandon Jesus and leave him. Even Peter in verse 26 to 31 says, Even if all fall away, I will not. Even if I to die, I will not leave you. And Christ says to him, Peter, you will deny me three times, and when you do so, the rooster will crow. And it did. And Peter did deny him three times. And the rooster crowed just like Jesus said. And you can only imagine that scene. Hearing this, it would be so easy for us to criticize these disciples. How could you share this intimate meal and yet later on betray him, deny him, abandon him, when he would need them the most. It would be easier for us to criticize for their lack of faith, their cowardice, their lack of loyalty, their lack of faith. But friends, we are just like them. We are that sinful. Is that when we see them, we should see ourselves. Because you see, if we were in the same situation, facing the same pressure, would you have acted any differently? Perhaps we would have done the same thing. I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking. I've never seen. I've never been with him. I never followed him. Perhaps if you were offered a great sum of money, maybe you too would have betrayed him, denied him, walked away from him. Don't you see, my friends, it's through these disciples we see the reality of ourselves that we are just as sinful, that we too are capable of this. To think about, these are the men who wrote most of the New Testament, and yet if they were able and they were capable of such things, then how much more for you and I? Are you and I not capable of denying him and walking away from him as well? And that's what we have to see. We have to see the depth of our own hearts, and we have to cry out, is it I, Lord? And you know what he says? It is you. It's you. You have betrayed me, denied me, abandoned me. That's why Pastor Tim Keller says we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. That whenever you see the most wickedness on TV, when you see that murderer, when you see that horrible crime, when you look at that moment, do you say, how could they do that? Or do you look at that moment and say, you know what, I could do the same thing. I am capable of such heinous sin in my own life. I am such capable of murder. I am capable of such adultery. I am capable of such hatred. 
It's so easy for us to say they're like that. You're the betrayer. But is it I, Lord? And he says, it is you. That we are that simple. And yet this is the meal that Christ will share with. These are the people that Christ will share his last meal with. You see, the table is for such people. Not perfect. Not righteous. But sinful, betraying, abandoning, denying disciples. That's what this table is for. It's for sinners. But you see why? It's because that's, what the, that's why the table is absolutely necessary. Because we are sinners. It's not those for those who are worthy, but for those who recognize that they are unworthy. Who recognize that they can say, it is, is it I? It is I, Lord. I'm the one who will fail you. But as you know, when we come to this Passover meal, as I said before, there are things that are missing. And there is very one essential item that is missing at this meal that Jesus would have with his disciple, this Passover meal. What is that one thing? It is the lamb. Have you noticed? You see, one of the most craziest stories of the Old Testament is when God told Abraham to go and sacrifice his only begotten son. His only son, I'm sorry. Isaac, the son whom he loved. And remember the story where Abraham and Isaac are going up that mountain and Isaac is carrying the firewood on his back and Isaac turns to his father and says, Dad, here are the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham replies, God himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. In that moment, Abraham told his son, you are that lamb. You are that sacrifice. You can imagine the disciples saying, uh, Jesus, here are the bitter herbs. Here is a concoction of you know, vegetables and, and vinegar and nuts. Uh, but here's the wine, but here's the bread. But where is the Passover lamb? Now, you kind of forgot the most important thing. As a matter of fact, none of the gospels mention the lamb at the Passover meal. Why? Because Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is the Lamb of God. This is why John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, cried out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the sacrificial Lamb to whom all the other lambs pointed to. It is His sacrifice that will end all sacrifice. It is His blood that will wash away our sins. It is because He is the ultimate sacrifice that we could come and we could eat of the bread and we could drink of the cup. It's because he is the ultimate sacrifice. There will be no more need for blood and guts at this meal. Why? Because the final lamb will be slain. There will be no more need for the blood of lambs and goats, rams and goats. Why? Because Christ is the one who will pay that price once and for all. For all the lambs pointed to this one. And that is why he takes the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to him and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given things, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many. In other words, Jesus is saying that I am the main course. I am the Lamb of God. Take, eat and drink of me. Participate in me. You see, it's a shed blood that is the blood of the new covenant. And it is poured out for many, not only for the Jews, but for all sinners, for all transgressors, for all those who rebelled against God. It's His blood. And this covenant is a far greater covenant. Because Christ is the one who has secured it through His sacrifice upon the cross. You see, he is the one whose body will be broken. His blood is the one that will be said, spilled because of our sins. He is the one who will endure the wrath and the justice of God. He is the one who will drink the cup of God's wrath so that we can drink this cup, the cup of blessing indeed. You see, the horrific and gruesome death shows us how gruesome and filthy that our sin is that would require him to die such an evil and heinous death for us. 
And by telling them to come and eat and drink, he's showing them and telling them how much he loves them. He knows that they will betray him. He knows that they will be cowards. Yet he still tells them that he loves them. He is inviting them in. And he's reminding them that I always will be with you. That even though you leave, even though you will fail me, I will always be with you. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you were taken out to a meal where you knew that it cost you an arm and a leg? Like, just bankrupt you, right? When was the last time someone splurged on you where you went to a meal and you were waiting for the check and the server comes to you and says, you know what, uh, that gentleman over there paid for it all, right? When was the last time that happened to you where you were just absolutely blown away by someone who just splurged on you? Recently, Sora and I were treated to perhaps maybe the greatest meal of our lives, right? It cost an arm and a leg. But this couple were so gracious to us, and they said, you know what? We wanted to do something for you, and they treated us to this meal. And Sora and I had a great time. We loved that meal. I think it was probably even better because it was free, right? It's always better when it's free, right? It tastes so much better. We were just blown away, and, and Sora and I were just so grateful because as this couple just showered their love and their grace upon me and Sora at that moment. But when you get showered that kind of love, what's your first initial reaction? A little bit of guilt, right? I feel kind of guilty, right? Uh, it's just kind of weird, right? You want, you, someone loves you that much. But as soon as that guilt is gone, you, you sit there and you, this idea of this love that just overwhelms you and you, you're so, you feel so grateful and you feel so valued and you feel so loved in that moment. And the reason why you feel like that, because you feel like it's, you, you're so unworthy of this generosity. You don't feel like you're deserving of this generosity. Why would they do this? This is simply because your friends love you and they just want to express that love for you as well. That today I want you to see that's what this meal is all about. Because this is the costliest meal you will ever eat. And when you think about this meal, when you think about the costliest meal that you've ever eaten, I want you to know that there is no more costly a meal than this. That it would cost the very life of God's only begotten Son so that you will be able to share and eat this meal. A meal that can never have been bought because you can never ever afford it. Yet God is the one who splurges on you and says, I love you. Come and eat. Come and eat at this meal that you could have never bought, you could have never paid for. So that you would know how much you are loved. Remember that those who were given this meal were betrayers, deniers, abandoners. Yet God is the one who says, come and eat and drink. He splurges his love on you. Because you see, this table is for sinners like us. And that's why, my dear friends, every time we come to the table, the bread and cup reminds us that he is present with us. It's not that bread literally becomes the body and the, the, the cup literally becomes the blood of Jesus. No, that's not what he's saying. How could that be when Jesus is there when he's offering the bread and the cup and says, this is my body and this is my blood? It's because he knows that he's going to go to a cross and die. But he wants them to know that every time you come and you eat of the bread and you drink of the cup in this way, that I am there with you. That I am present there. It's not simply that we eat and drink in memory of what Christ has done, but we know that he is present with us every time we come to eat of the bread and we drink of the cup because he says to you, this is my body and this is my blood. Eat and drink all of you so that you would know that he is present, so you would find strength in that moment as you eat, as he nourishes your soul, as he gives you strength to live out this life. He wants you to know that he is here. Not in memory, not literally become the blood, but he is present as he's offering himself to us. He invites you to feed on him, to be nourished by him, to be strengthened 
by him. Don't you see when he lays out this table before us, he's giving himself to us. And we receive it by faith. We come and we eat because we need to. And we taste and see that the Lord is good. That the Lord, Lord does invite us. That the Lord loves us and invites us to come in. But as I said before, that was the second thing, right? That was a shock. Before that, this is the Passover of my feast, but he said, this bread is my body. This cup is my blood. That was also what was different about this Passover meal. But finally, we see that the final thing that we see that was different about this meal. If you notice that the Last Supper is an unfinished meal. Remember we said that there were four cups. But here we see that Christ does not drink the fourth cup. As a matter of fact, we see that last surprise for Christ says, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Christ is pointing to the future. When he says that, you know what, that one day that I will drink this cup in the kingdom of God, in glory. That there will come a day in glory that I will have this feast and I will drink this, I will eat and drink of this glorious feast in the glories of heaven above. And guess what? It will be with you. Matthew 26, 29 says, I tell you, I will not drink of the, right, Matthew 26, 29, a different version of the Last Supper story. He says, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew adds that phrase, with you in my Father's kingdom. How assuring the word, those words must have been. Here are these betrayers. Here are these deniers. Here are those who are going to abandon him. You know what Jesus says? That one day I will eat of this feast again. We will eat of this again. We will eat and drink again. But it will be in glory. And you will eat and drink with me. And you could imagine after he died and resurrected, what that most of must have been like for his disciples. As they would eat and drink of the Lord's table again afterwards. As they remember that moment when he says that someone will betray me, you will all deny me. And yet they look forward to the future. To the day that they will eat this banqueting table with the Lord God Almighty in heaven above. And that's what we do when we come to the Lord's table. Do you know what we have a taste of? Glory. Yeah, that wafer tastes nasty. Yeah, that cup is all weird. But man, it is sweet because we have a taste of glory. And when we eat and we drink, we look forward to the day that we will eat and drink with him. For he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Do you understand, my friend? There is an eschatological feast. There's a heavenly feast waiting for you and for me. And we will share in that feast with him in glory. And how do we know? that we will get there. How do we know that we will eat of this with him? If you notice in Matthew, uh, Mark 14, it began with this idea what Jesus tells the disciples, there'll be a man carrying water and he will tell you where the Passover will be. He tells Peter that you're going to deny me three times and the rooster will crow and the, he did deny him three times and the rooster crowed. He talked about someone who will betray him and someone did betray him. Everything that Jesus said would happen, happened. And if Jesus can control these things on earth, right, the man carrying the water. By the way, usually men don't carry water. That's why they, that was very different. That's why they're saying that's the guy. Usually it was the woman that carried the water, right? And so all these things, these little things that he said will happen, happen. And then that's going to happen when he says that I will not drink this cup and with, until, with you in the kingdom of heaven. Don't you think God will be able to control that as well? Then when we, eat of the drink, when we eat of the cup and we drink of the bread, we realize how we screw up, how we fail, how we betray him. And we wonder, God, how am I going to get there? Because you know what? He is going to be the one to ensure. And that's where I find my hope. That in spite of all my shortcomings, that's why I need the table 
and deep. My dear friends, this is why the table is so significant. It reminds us the past, the body was broken, the blood was shed, so that you and I could be able to have that future feast, right? It reminds us of the present, that he is here with us. He is here with us as we eat and as we drink the cup. And it makes us long for the future because we know that one day we will eat that glorious feast in heaven above. And when we think about all of these things, do you see how much he loves you? Do you see how he splurges his love upon you as you come, as you eat of this table? That's why this table is beautiful. That's why the Lord's Supper is so rich and satisfying for your soul. This is why we come with humility, with joy. With humility because of the fact that we know that we are like these disciples. It is I. Not is it I, it is I. But yet he receives us loves us, and tells us to come, take, and eat, and drink. My dear friends, I pray that this table will always be something you cherish, where you see it as a means of grace for where you grow as you experience how much God loves you in this table indeed. Let us pray. And now we're going to about to partake in the bread and the cup. And today I ask you uh, to prepare your hearts. Is it I? Yes, it is you. Yet in spite of your sin, in spite of your betrayal, he still says, come and eat and drink. Doesn't matter what you have done. That's how much I love you. And as you eat, know that you are, he's there with you. He's here. May you find comfort and strength. And as you eat, may you long for that day, that one day that you experience the glories of heaven with him, enjoying that final feast in heaven above, where he will drink that last cup with you. Can you wait for that day? What a gift. Thank you, Jesus, for this table. So can we just spend a moment as we prepare our hearts and we will come before the Lord's table. God, we come now to your table, the table that you have prepared for us, so that, God, that we know that you are here, that, God, that we can nourish our souls, that we can feed upon you and find strength. Father God, today, as we're reminded in your word that you splurging on us, because you are the one who paid the cost for this meal. We did not pay for it. We did not earn it. And yet, Father God, you graciously paid for it. So that, God, that we can delight in the richest affair. I pray that, God, that we will come to eat. And that we will enjoy this table. And that, God, we will know that you welcome us in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our sins, in spite of our betrayals, our denials, our abandonment. You still say, come and eat and drink. And I pray that, God, we will come with boldness. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name.
Let's all rise one last time as we remind ourselves of the man of sorrows who died for those who betrayed him.
sinner man. The sinner man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' way. Silent as he stood. coming and worshiping us with us today and today was your first time we would love to meet you afterwards i think there was a lunch prepared today after service so please join us as we have lunch prepared for all of you also i want to thank everyone who participated in operation christmas child uh, thank you for bringing your shoe boxes um it is too late afterwards I'm, I'm assuming so clara is it too late to maybe this week provide more boxes or no Okay, next week is the very last week, so I want to make sure that we make that clear. So again, last chance for all your procrastinators. If you would like to help out for Operation Christmas Child, we have one more week allowable. So that's going to be held next week. Also, next week is Thanksgiving Sunday. Um, 
Uh, we would love to have you join us as we eat and feast together, as we celebrate and give thanks to the Lord for all his blessings. And so um, if you notice in the program, there is that doodle sheet. I know Kathy would love for you. Please sign up. Uh, it make, make our life a lot easier. Um, but again, all the main things will be provided for, but we'd love to have you provide the size or whatever it may be. So please sign up so that Kathy could have a good week ahead of her. And so uh, we would really appreciate all of you to do that as well. And now may receive God's benediction. benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen and amen.